I'm going to introduce our first full panel presenter, uh, who is Paolo Verardi. He is the Associate Professor in the Department of Pathobiology and Veterinary Science in our College of Agriculture, Health and Natural Resources. And he's an investigator at the Center of Excellence for Vaccine Research at UConn. Dr. Verardi has a broad background in molecular biology, virology and immunology, an interest in vaccine and immunotherapeutic vector development. He has worked on vaccines and diagnostics for human and domestic animal viruses, including rinderpest, smallpox, AIDS, Rift Valley fever, foot and mouth disease, and more recently Zika virus, as well as SARS-CoV-2, and some other mosquito and tick-borne agents such as Powassan virus. So don't forget that at any time, you are welcome to submit questions in the chat and we will relay those to Dr. Variety at the end of his talk. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Paolo Variety. All right, thank you, Jennifer, for the nice introduction. I hope you guys all can hear me and see my presentation as I intended. So um, today I'll be talking about climate, health, and uh, you know the thing that I do, which is the development of vaccines, in this case here for vector-borne diseases, and I'm calling this a ticking bomb, uh, both because you know uh, time is uh, running out essentially, and you know because I'll, I'll be talking a lot about ticks as we'll see later on. And again, I just want to emphasize I am a professor of virology and vaccinology, and you know just in 2020, still in early 2020, I had to, you know, people just didn't know much about that word. Now it sort of doesn't need an introduction anymore after the pandemic. But again, thank you, you know, for the invitation. It's great to be here. So uh, I'll try to, uh, I know actually this weekend, uh, um, I was reading a magazine from UC Davis. Actually, I am originally from Brazil. Uh, I got my PhD at the University of California Davis in the vet school there. And I get this magazine that they send, you know, to the alumni. Uh, and there was an interesting one, you know, an, an interesting little note there. Higher temps change tick behavior. And I said, oh, this needs, you know, further investigation. So it turns out that these uh, uh, students were doing some uh, uh, studies with the with brown dog ticks. Uh, um, they uh, uh, are known to transmit Rocky Mountain spotted fever, which is a, a disease called uh, caused by this bacteria, Rickettsia rickettsi. And um, you know what they did was very ingenious. They actually built you know this this box, these wooden boxes, and they put some dogs there because these are uh, dog ticks. And they also had another box where they actually put a human there, a human volunteer, a student. And they, uh, they actually bridged the two boxes together and they put ticks right in the middle, you know, in this transparent uh, 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 tube that they had. And what they, uh, they found was very interesting. They found that if um, they raise the temperature to 100 degrees, the ticks were two and a half more likely to go towards the human than the dog uh, when, they were, when uh, you know, uh, compared to, to the same experiment done at 74 degrees, which is a more, uh, you know, reasonable temperature. So again, you know, suggesting that this rising temperatures here, you know, could lead to more human infections because, you know, these ticks, uh, the, the, the tick behavior changes a little bit with the temperature. So that was just timely and interesting. And um, another thing that I want to just mention is, I mean, we can't really escape the fact that we are in the middle of a pandemic, right? So earlier in March, I was reading, you know, this article on The Guardian. It just caught my attention for two things. One, it was, it was because I was talking about COVID-19, but the other one was this picture. And, um, and this picture here is here in the US in Washington state. You see here, there's a golf course here with people, you know, golfing. Um, some people looking at what else, you know, was going on on the background here. And for God's sake, you know, the whole hill there is on fire. So this is a wildfire. Uh, it, it actually is back from 2017. But the point here is, uh, I mean, there are many points that I want to discuss here, but you know, Two of the major uh, challenges that we're going to be facing uh, from now on are infectious diseases. And in, in, in fact, we are in the middle of a pandemic. So further pandemics, that, that type of thing. And in in climate change, obviously, right? So my point here is really that, you know, that, that this should be a wake-up call, right? The, the clock is ticking, so, so to speak. This should be a wake-up call. And what we cannot do is what these people are doing because they're really not paying attention to what's happening just behind them, right? 
some people here seem to be paying attention, but quite honestly, they uh, they seem to be interested in what's going on, not alarmed exactly about what's going on over there. So it is time for us to uh, you know uh, to get alarmed. This is an alarm clock. We have to uh, to start pay paying attention to uh, uh, climate change in infectious diseases. And in fact, the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, has been paying attention to this for the longest time, for uh, decades, quite honestly. And, uh, and this is straight from the website. You know, they have the uh, uh, website on climate effects on health, and they list a number of different things, including wildfires that I just show, showed you there, floods, you know, air pollution, uh, temperature extremes, uh, obviously. They do also cite food and waterborne diarrheal diseases. So this will be diseases caused by uh, infectious uh, agents. Hello, sorry and, to interrupt, but we're not seeing your slides. Really? Yeah, any of them or just the last one? Nothing. It looks like it's not being shared. All right, so let me uh, try it again. So no worries, in the show, and uh, try to show, but you saw the first one, right? No, we haven't seen anything. I've only seen you speak. Oh my God, you, you, why didn't you guys tell me that? We just realized, we are like, wait a minute. Okay, there we go. Okay, we'll All right. screen screen. I really apologize. Okay, uh, let's get uh, you, switch your screens. Like, we need to Okay, do. I'll just briefly just mention, this is just my, my initial slide, okay? okay. And, again, and it I looks like you just need that. to switch your um, screen input again. Okay, good. Uh, but you can see now, right? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, so this is what I was talking about, that little experiment with the dogs, okay, those uh, uh, very smart students at, at UC Davis in the vet school there. Uh, this is the slide that I was talking about um, regarding the, um, the uh, you know, the wildfires in uh, Washington state. And people here are not really paying much of an attention, right, uh, to what was going on there. You know, some people kind of are curious, but not really alarmed. And that's, what, that's the wake up call, you know, that, that I was talking about. So back to where I was. So I'm glad that uh, you guys uh, uh, told me about this. So uh, the CDC has been paying attention uh, uh, about this for the longest time, including uh, uh, food and waterborne diarrheal diseases and also diseases carried by vectors. You know, these, are, these will be typically mosquitoes, ticks, and fleas. Uh, I'll be talking mostly about and will be mostly concerned about mosquitoes and ticks uh, for this talk, but fleas, you know, uh, as well. And in fact, the EPA, the US Environmental Protection Agency, has a number of different climate change indicators. You know, for example, greenhouse uh, gases, obviously, you know, the ocean, the weather itself, and obviously. And uh, they, they, they have a number that fall into this category here of health and society. And, um, and if you're looking at the list of the indicators, a couple of them are actually infectious diseases like Lyme disease and West Nile virus. It's interesting because this one is a tick-borne disease, Lyme disease, and this one is a mosquito-borne uh, disease, West Nile virus, and they use that as climate change indicators. And I'll give an example here for Lyme disease. Um, these are the number of reported cases, you know, since 19, uh, around 1990 to uh, about 2018, I believe. So you see that, you know, the number of, case, of reported cases are increasing. And obviously Lyme, is uh, very relevant to us here in New England, right? Not only old Lyme, you know, Lyme is right here in Connecticut. Uh, you know, we, we actually have a high prevalence of Lyme disease here. And I want to emphasize also that these are the reported cases. So uh, each year, about 30,000 cases of Lyme disease are reported to the CDC. But in reality, we know that that's an, uh, that is under report, uh, reporting. Not, not every doctor, you know, decides to make the, to take the, the time really to report that. So the CDC estimates that more than 10,000, I'm sorry, more than 10 times more, uh, you know, uh, those reported cases are actually, you know, occurring and that we have about 476,000 cases per year. So uh, that's pretty significant. There's about, you know, half a million new cases of Lyme disease each year, okay? This doesn't mean that it's, you know, over a range of time, it's each single year. And perhaps, you know, this map here will, will convince you that this is a big problem. And we all know we are from New England after all. But uh, these are, you know, the number of reported cases. Again, just report or remember, it's probably 10 times more than this um, uh, in 1996. And this is 22 years later, you know, 2018. Um, and you can see here that, you know, in the, the number of reported cases have increased dramatically. Things have been moving west. You can see here the state of Pennsylvania, you know, just took over 
the state of New York it has a number of more cases. And then you can see here that the northern New England states, you know, that were relatively unaffected early on, 20, about 20 years ago, uh, are now seeing a lot of cases of Lyme disease. Uh, disregard here, Massachusetts, they are not any special. They are just not reporting the cases for 2018 for some reason. So they're not showing those cases here, but they do have, you know, a, a high concentration of uh, Lyme disease cases there. So what you see is that, you know, of all of these different places, uh, uh, Northern New England here is really where you have the biggest change, the biggest total increase in the number of cases per uh, 100,000 people. The numbers here for Connecticut, Mass, and, and New York are, could not be calculated because of this, those reporting issues that I told you before. But, but this is a big deal. And um, obviously, you know, when you talk about weather and climate drivers that would you know, either favor the, the, the tick life cycle increase the risk to humans, increase uh, the proportion of the ticks that are infected by uh, the uh, pathogens that cause disease like Lyme disease. So you have to consider a number of things, you know, the vector themselves, the ticks in this case, you, you know that, you know, adults lay eggs that uh, molt into larvae and then into nymphs and then into adults. And this is a complicated multi-year life cycle, right? It involves both is, uh, reproduction hosts. These are uh, things like deer, in large mammals that the adults mostly feed on. And it also involves reservoir hosts, other smaller mammals, things like uh, uh, mice and other types of small, smaller mammals. And these are the ones that actually carry those pathogens. We usually don't think much about them. We, we, we usually tend to think about the deer, but the deer actually are not really responsible for transmitting the, um, uh, the pathogens. It's these small uh, rodents, um, uh, and other types of mammals that infect larvae and nymphs. And those are the ones, you know, that then will um, uh, feed on humans. There will be incidental hosts, really. Um, and, and therefore, you know, you're going to have the potential for transmission of disease there. So we have different types of hosts. Then we have us as, a, as a incidental hosts. We are changing our behaviors. We are changing our environment. And obviously, temperature and humidity are really affecting this. Temperature, for example, could make the life cycle of the ticks a little bit shorter and increase their abundance. Um, temperature and humidity tend to contribute to the questing uh, uh, of nymphs and adults, and therefore, you know, their ability to um, to um, uh, infect or to to bite, you know, humans. That that type of thing. So we really have to put it all together, and it's much more complicated. So we have us here, humans as incidental hosts. We have heat. We have humidity and precipitation. Um, on the tick side of things, uh, uh, we have the reproduction hosts, we have the reservoir hosts, the white-footed mouse actually is one of the main players. This is really you know, the, the, uh, the main uh, source of those pathogens that actually get trans, you know, that, in, that infect the ticks that then later on will infect us. We have the landscape, we have to take into account you know, all of our landscape, the changes that you are making to our landscape, including, for example, uh, one that's usually talked about is the Japanese uh, barberry. That's an invasive species, and it sort of makes a perfect habitat for ticks and white-footed mice, uh, um, you know, allows, you know, the, the, the questing behavior, that type of thing. So many, many things to think about. Also on the mosquito side, we have many things to think about. Not only the mosquitoes and the, the fact that, you know, uh, with temperatures uh, uh, rising, it becomes easier for them to travel north. You know, certain mosquitoes are, are limited, you know, uh, in terms of the temperature uh, that they uh, um, uh, are able to colonize a certain region and, and thrive in a certain region. As temperatures rise, that's gonna change. And then again, the environment, the environment, those habitats, right, are changing both natural habitats and actually human-made uh, habitats. That's a huge problem in other countries where, you know, especially with precipitation and this type of environment here that creates uh, uh, um, water accumulation, you, uh, those are breeding grounds for mosquitoes, right? So you can imagine that in more tropical areas where you have a lot of rain, this is a, this is a major problem. So you have to take all of those things into account and quite honestly, much more than this and things that, and things that perhaps we're not even thinking much about. So, you know, the reality is uh, the 
temperature is supposed you know to to go up and here we have you know an estimate you know of the change in temperatures uh, uh in 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 this century here between 2000 and 2100 and you can see that pretty much everywhere you know every uh place in, in the world is going to have an increase in temperature including us here in new england it's going to be even more uh, uh, uh the, the change is going to be even greater you know north of us actually and then there are going to be changes in precipitation as well some places actually will get like us here more precipitation some places are going to get less precipitation this is the amazon you know basin right in uh, in brazil where i'm coming from where i come from some places are going to have a huge increase i mean just look at you know this part here of india it is expected to get a huge a huge increase in precipitation so uh some th these are some pathogens okay not all of them are vector borne but uh some are like yellow fever japanese encephalitis you know, so if you think about these climate drivers, you know, both temperature and precipitation drive them. Uh, um, for some of them, you know, it's mostly uh, driven by temperature. Some of those is mostly driven by precipitation. And these are all projections based on models, you know, that type of thing. Quite honestly, we don't understand this, you know, well enough. I don't think we are very sophisticated yet to understand, you know, how, how these changes are going to affect uh, some of these pathogens. But uh, but clearly, you know, those those changes are going to come. And in fact, it's happening already. So uh, in 2018, the CDC uh, uh, provided a report that actually was made, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, was uh, widely distributed and talked about in the media. So you might have heard about it. And it was, you know, a report that said that cases from mosquitoes, ticks and fleas uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, diseases from mosquito ticks and fleas have tripled in the, the last 13 years. So essentially going from uh, about 27,000 to 96,000. Again, these are the reported cases, okay? Remember, we have much more than the reported cases, but you can clearly see, you know, a trajectory here. So uh, not only we have three times more cases of diseases uh, transmitted by mosquitoes and ticks, we actually, in this time period, we got, uh, since 2004, we got nine new pathogens, nine new germs that are spread by, by mosquitoes and ticks. Some were discovered, in other words, we didn't even know that they existed, and some actually have been introduced from other places in the world here in, in the United States. So that's, you know, it's a, it's a relatively short period of time to have, you know, nine new uh, pathogens of uh, quite significant relevance, okay, uh, showing up. And then, you know, we're not prepared for it. About 80% of vector control organizations, you know, really lack critical prevention and control capacities. We tend, they tend to be very, you know, uh, um, uh, um, region specific. You know, certain regions are not prepared, you know, don't, don't, don't typically control mosquitoes very much, that type of thing. Certain uh, regions don't, don't think much about tick control, that type of thing. So in other words, we are not prepared. And um, this, the report, you know, listed a huge number of uh, mosquito-borne diseases and tick-borne diseases that have been reported, you know, during this period here in the U.S., including things like malaria or even dengue. You know, there, there are cases, usually people that travel to places where dengue is endemic, that type of thing. But a number of these things are, you know, just present right here. We have a number of these California serial group viruses that I'll mention to you later, uh, later on. Eastern equine encephalitis, triple E, it was a big problem, you know, probably the, the virology news before the pandemic, if you remember the fall of um, 2019, the early fall of 2019, where we had lots of cases of uh, triple E here in, uh, in New England, uh, uh, particularly Rhode Island, Connecticut, and Massachusetts. Um, West Nile virus has been with us, you know, uh, for a while now, now since 1999, and it was uh, introduced here in the U.S., and then Zika virus, which I'll tell you the whole story, you know, in a little bit. And a number of tick-borne diseases, you know, a lot of them are caused by parasites or, or bacteria. Uh, some of them are caused by viruses like Powassan virus. I added a couple of them here, uh, Heartland and, and Bourbon viruses. These are relatively new viruses. Um, and, and, you know, um, there are cases of these in, in the U.S. as well. And uh, if that's not enough, you know, we actually are getting new tick species in New England, okay? And I'll, I'll just focus on in Connecticut because that's what I'm mostly familiar with. In 2017, so not a long time ago, you know, the Lone Star tick got established here in Connecticut. So uh, uh, um, this is the tick that transmits a number of different uh, uh, vector-borne diseases, tick-borne diseases. And it also causes the red meat allergy. 
I mean, uh, it can cause red meat allergy. This is because the tick saliva has this sugar that we don't possess. Uh, it is present in red meat. And therefore, you know, some of us uh, uh, that get bitten by the tick may end up developing, you know, this uh, 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 red meat allergy. So this is a new tick now established here in Connecticut. The Asian longhorn tick is a tick that was a, a exotic here to the US. And in 2017 or so, you know, was found here in the US. And in 2018, was actually found here in the state of Connecticut. Um, it's very interesting because uh, this tick here doesn't, you know, these are females and they don't need a male to uh, 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 reproduce, to make more of themselves. So they, they actually have this process called parthenogenesis, where they, uh, they can produce more of themselves, you know, just the, the females can produce more of themselves um, uh, without actually the need of, um, uh, of a male tick. So they can reproduce very, very quickly and they can transmit a number of different diseases. In fact, uh, some of the sticks have, found, have been found already um, uh, with the Lyme disease bacterium called Borrelia uh, burgdorferi. And then, you know, just last year, you know, a new tick showed up here, the Go, uh, Gulf Coast, uh, Coast tick. Um, um, it causes a number of human and actually uh, uh, a dog disease um, um, uh, that, that is of significance. So as you can see, not only we're increasing the number of pathogens, we're actually getting even more, you know, different tick species and potentially getting more of those pathogens um, uh, um, here. So uh, in other words, the news are not good, right? So we, we, we really have to, uh, you know, the number of uh, tick-borne diseases are increasing, the number of pathogens are increasing, the number of tick species are increasing, the actual number of ticks are increasing. So kind of a perfect storm type of situation. And an increase in temperature and humidity is only expected to exacerbate that, right? So now I'll take, uh, I'll change things slightly. I'll talk, I'll give you two examples of the work that I do that it is on vaccine development. So here I have, you know, a COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, I hope that all of you got your COVID-19 shot. Um, I have myself been working with the SARS coronavirus 2 that causes uh, COVID-19, but I will not be talking about that at all. I'll be talking on two examples here. One I'll talk about in detail, which is Zika virus. Uh, and I'll talk about this virus-like particle-based vaccines that we developed. And, the, and then I'll talk briefly, really, about some tick-borne flavy viruses and, and bunya viruses and, and how uh, we are developing uh, these virus-like particle-based vaccines. And these are some of the people that were involved in this project. This is myself there. So I'll tell you a little bit about Zika virus, which is, uh, you know, a mosquito uh, transmitted disease, so mosquito born, and it's really a re-emerging pathogen. So it's not like Zika virus just show up from nowhere. It's been, you know, around for a while. We just, we're not really paying attention to it. So uh, let me tell you a little bit of the, about the history because it's very interesting. As I told you, the virus was first discovered in 1947. So it was a while ago in Uganda. And then, you know, the, there was only a few sporadic cases, like the, in 1960, there was the first human case in Nigeria that was reported. There were, I know, some additional cases here and there. Quite honestly, only about, you know, 7, 14, I don't remember now, human reported cases until 2007, when in the uh, Yap Island in, in uh, Micronesia, where there was a big outbreak there. And it's a small island, and in fact, you know, the entire island, really, you know, almost everybody in the island ended up uh, contracting Zika virus. People from the CDC here in the US were sent over there to study it. And one of those people, when uh, he returned here to the US, um, he actually transmitted Zika virus uh, to his wife. And it turns out that Zika virus is present in, sem in semen and it can you know, uh, be sexually transmitted. And that's the only reason why in 2008, when that was reported, that I knew of the existence of a virus called Zika virus, because for me, it was like, wow, look at this interesting Flavy virus that actually is sexually, can be sexually transmitted. And that was, you know, uh, all that we cared about, you know, a lot of people got infected with mild disease. Uh, it was not really, you know, a significant out uh, outbreak other than that, only really mild disease. In 2013, you know, uh, there were some cases in uh, an epidemic actually in French Polynesia. And then, you know, we think that in between 2013 and 2014, the virus got transmitted, you know, here to, to South America, probably to Brazil, perhaps to another place, you know, in, in, in between. But anyway, in, the, in 2015, 
it became evident that, that there was a lot of Zika virus cases in Brazil. I was actually visiting Brazil. I'm from Brazil. I was visiting a number of different areas, including you know an area right here in the middle of the country um, that is known to have a lot of dengue virus, other flavy viruses like dengue virus and so on. Um, and for me, it was a curiosity. Again, you know, this is a virus. It doesn't cause much of a disease, you know, anything. So this was the, I spent the summer over there. I came here to the United States for the fall. I, I started teaching. And then some interesting things started happening. But before, let me just tell you, you know, nobody really cared much about it because about 80% of the people that get Zika virus don't even show symptoms. They don't even know that they got infected. And those 20% that actually get symptoms, they have, uh, you know, a little bit of fever, uh, red eyes, you know, a little bit of a headache. They do have a little bit of a rash, joint pain, and muscle pain, but that's about it. It's almost like, you know, your typical, you know, flu-like symptoms, that type of thing. Only a very few people get something called the Guillain-Barre syndrome, where you have muscle weakness. You know, it's actually a pretty severe, you know, a complication from infection, but it's actually not unique to Zika virus. Even, you know, influenza can cause, you know, a Guillain-Barre syndrome. A number of different things, in fact, even things other than, than uh, infectious agents can cause Guillain-Barre syndrome. So uh, it's, it's very rare. So that was okay. But then, you know, in October 2015, so this is in, in the fall, you know, we, people started noticing this big increase in, uh, in microcephaly cases uh, in uh, uh, newborns, uh, particularly in the northern part of Brazil. So, uh, you know, it was way above, you know, background levels uh, uh, and, uh, and, you know, and literally what we were doing, we we're looking at the news and seeing the news about, you know, the spread of Zika virus and <laughs> seeing the news about the increase in the number of microcephaly cases. And people started wondering if there was a link. Eventually, a link, you know, was established. I, I first started noticing this, you know, as the cases were being um, reported, so we here in the United States at, at UConn here, we started immediately working on a vaccine for Zika because for me, it didn't take much convincing uh, uh, to, to make a link between microcephaly and, and Zika. Uh, the rest of the world, you know, was a little bit more skeptical. So, so people here in the US didn't hear about Zika virus in 2015. It only started hearing about it in, in early 2016 when the number of cases started to really increase a lot. And, um, and, you know, and, and the potential for transmission here in the US uh, became more clear. So um, Zika virus is a flavy virus. So, uh, if, you know, other viruses in, the, in this group include, include yellow fever, uh, dengue virus, West Nile virus that we have a lot here, Tripoli that we have a lot here in the, in, in the New England area, uh, Powassan, which I'll tell you a little bit more, you know, in the future, they all fall into this category here, you know, in this genus called flavy virus. And uh, they have a, a genome that's about 11 kilobases in size, is a single-stranded RNA genome, similar to coronaviruses, to be honest, except the coronaviruses are about 30,000 kilobases, so they are about one-third of a coronavirus, okay, so to speak. But they are different, it's a completely different class of viruses, and they, have, they express three what we call structural proteins. These are the C, M, and E, so it's the capsid, the pre-membrane, and the envelope proteins. And uh, these proteins actually uh, uh, make up the virion, the virus particle, and a number of non-structural proteins, NS, and those are involved in, in the replication of the virus. So when we, we start developing, uh, you know, think, start thinking about developing a vaccine, we focus on those structural proteins. And in fact, we focus on the E protein. The E protein is the equivalent to the spike protein of coronavirus, so to speak. It's not the same thing, but it's equivalent. So uh, it is the main target of what we call neutralizing antibodies. So it's really the protein that you want to have in your vaccine composition. However, to form these virus-like particles, to have you know, the formation of particles that actually resemble the virus, you not only have to express E, but you have to express PRN, you know, this other protein, the precursor. And, uh, and why do we want to you know, uh, emphasize the production of virus, uh, virus-like particles is because they really look like native virions. They look like native virus particles. They would present to the immune system all of those conformational epitopes. So they really look like the real virus. And, uh, and because of that, they, they induce stronger immune responses. They, uh, uh, they are better than if we just you know, produce the E protein alone, for example. 
you know, there were some barriers. We knew that we knew that we were going to have some barriers. You know, the way that these proteins are produced, they are produced as a long chain, okay, of uh, amino acids that goes across the ER membrane a number of different times and then continues. And, uh, and they have to be processed by host and uh, viral proteases in a particular way and order so that you can assemble those virus-like particles. So we knew that we needed to have what we call the signal uh, uh, peptides or the signal sequence that is actually part of the capsid, even though we don't need the capsid for the production of the VLPs, we, needed that, we knew that we needed to keep that uh, 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 to produce those uh, VLPs. So one of the things that we did uh, as our vaccine platform, we actually use vaccinia virus, which is really a viral vector, you know, like uh, uh, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine uses the adeno, uh, for COVID-19 uses the adenovirus, uh, uh, an adenovirus as a viral vector. We're using uh, a vaccinia virus, which is actually the smallpox vaccine, is the, the, the virus that actually serves as the smallpox vaccine. And, uh, and we produce, you know, versions of these viruses that expressed, uh, you know, Zika virus, the Zika virus genes of interest, okay? In a way that they infect the cells, they uh, produce those um, proteins, but they don't replicate. So it's actually a replication defective vaccine virus. So very, very similar analogous, I would say, to the uh, Johnson & Johnson um, adenovirus-based vaccine or the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. So, you know, we expressed not only the envelope uh, alone, and we knew that this is probably not going to be good, but it, we also expressed the PRM together with the signal peptide. But when we look at the signal peptide in more detail, we realized that there was a, an amino acid there that's negatively charged, an aspartic acid. And it turns out the signal peptides, they, they tend to have a positively charged region, not a negatively charged region. And they tend to be hydrophobic. So we said, what if we put a hydrophobic amino acid there, like tryptophan? What if we put a positively charged amino acid, like a, a lysine? You know, we, we started making changes here. We also just said, you know, what if we just use uh, the signal peptide from another virus that has been shown to produce uh, these VLPs, you know, really well? So we tested a number of these different uh, mutations or variants, okay? And, uh, and here I'm showing the results for some of them. So here you have the cell lysis. So this is the protein produced in the cell. And here you have the protein that is actually secreted in the, in the supernatant, most likely in the form of a virus-like particle. And as you can see, the natural, you know, when you produce E alone, you know, you don't really have much of a secretion of anything. The natural signal was really very poorly, you know, secreted. But once we started making those modifications, we saw that we actually got very, you know, much, huge improvement in the production, the secretion of, um, of the E protein to the supernatant and therefore, you know, the production of those virus-like particles. And in fact, we just uh, we submitted a, a, a US provisional patent uh, for those mutations. But, uh, but, let, but let me show you, right? So this is a Z, an actual Zika virus uh, particle, virus particle, it's called the virion. And here is one of those virus-like particles that we produce. So it has, you know, about the same shape, the same size, that type of thing. Here's, here is a number of them. So we, we, we could secrete this and, and uh, purify them. And you could see, you know, a number of them here. So we, we actually use uh, this one that was the highest producer here with this particular mutation um, to uh, study uh, this in mice and, and test the mice as a vaccine. So. Um, what you see here, you know, one of the things that you do, obviously you guys all know now that we are very interested in, in uh, antibodies, right? Particularly neutralizing antibodies. But we in the vaccine field are also very interested in something that we call cell-mediated immune responses, cell-mediated immunity, particularly T-cell immune responses. And for viruses, you know, we are usually interested in CD4 positive or CD, CD, CD8 positive. I'm showing you here results for the CD8 for a CD8 positive T cell epitope. And as you can see, the vaccine here, this is the, the vaccine. This is the vector alone used as a control. So the vaccine induced great levels of, um, uh, of these T cell responses, while the vector alone was a control here just with a buffer didn't induce any of those um, uh, CMI responses. So we were very happy with this. These are the types of things that are very good against viruses. And then obviously everybody talks about antibodies, right? You, you wanna know, you know what the antibody responses are. And, um, 
So uh, we, we, we uh, vaccinated uh, at week zero, then we boost actually at week two, and we also took blood samples then, and then we took blood samples at week four, and we vaccinated you know, e either uh, with a single shot or well, in a prime boost type of way. So we vaccinate, prime, and then boost. So uh, this will be the equivalent to the um, Johnson & Johnson vaccine, single shot. This, is, uh, this will be equivalent to the uh, messenger RNA vaccines that are giving us a prime boost type of approach. And we have a number of different controls here. You know, forget the controls, they are the vector alone and, and uh, you know, a number of different things. But the important thing is that, you know, indeed, the vaccines either given a, a, a singly or, or in a single dose or in, in a, a prime boost type of strategy, in other words, two doses, they induce good levels of antibodies measured by ELISA. These are just antibodies overall. But we also look at neutralizing antibodies by doing a particular type of assay called plaque reduction neutralization test. And we were able to show that we, you know, the vaccines did induce um, neutralizing antibodies as well. And then, you know, one of the things that we did is to uh, check if the mice that, that got vaccinated actually got protected from a challenge with the uh, Zika virus itself. So we had the same groups here, the controls, the single dose, the, the prime boost. And, uh, you know, at week four, we actually challenged and then we collected blood two days later. And we look at the amount of virus, of Zika virus in blood. Um, um, obviously, the controls that didn't get, you know, anything that was Zika specific, they allow the virus to replicate to very high levels. So you have something that's called viremia, which is virus in blood. But the uh, animals that received e either a single dose or a double dose did not show any virus in, uh, in blood. They were below the detection limit, this uh, detection limit. This was done by uh, a quantitative uh, RT-PCR type of thing. It's a very sensitive type of assay. And, uh, and they were all you know, below the, um, the detection limit. So that was, uh, was great news. We actually just published this um, uh, earlier this year. If you're interested, you, know, you can um, uh, take a look at this um, um, online. And then uh, now I'm going to switch a little bit and I'll tell you very briefly in the next five minutes or so about tick-borne flaviviruses and, uh, and also another class of viruses called uh, bunya virus. So I'm moving from, from uh, um, uh, mosquitoes to ticks now. So there is a group of uh, 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 tick-borne viruses. They are called tick-borne encephalitis complex flaviviruses. So they are in the same group as Zika virus, uh, but they are tick-borne and they cause encephalitis. So they cause inflammation of the brain, right? So uh, one of them is this uh, tick-borne encephalitis virus, TBEV. It is, a, it is assigned what we call a risk group four. So in other words, you know, uh, it's such a high risk that it needs to be handled, at least here in the US, it needs to be handled, handled in a special type of facility called biosafety level four facility where people have to wear, you know, essentially this is space suit type, type of things to handle the virus and do experiments with the virus is a, is a completely, you know, self-contained area. And this person here, you know, is breathing air through this tube. Um, once this person leaves this room, it, it receives a chemical treatment that destroys, you know, anything. And then the person can remove, you know, the, the, the space suit type of uh, 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 personal protective equipment. There's another, another virus, actually this one, this one here is not found here in the US, okay? It is exotic to the US and that's why in the US it requires biosafety level four. And there's another virus called Polassan virus. It is present here in the US in Canada. It is a risk group, group three. So it requires a facility called a biosafety level three facility, which uh, I have a picture of one here from the CDC. is the type of facility that is required to handle uh, SARS coronavirus 2 that causes COVID-19, okay? Uh, uh, you know, when you handle it, you don't actually have to have this type of uh, PPE. It's a different type of PPE, but it still re requires that level of facility. And this tick one encephalitis virus is a significant one. It's, it's actually found in, in uh, Asia, Russia, Eastern, you know, Europe, and it has been moving through Europe. And finally, in 2019, it was actually detected, it was found for the first time in the UK. So it actually jumped the, the, uh, um, uh, the ocean there and is now in the, uh, in the, in the UK. 
Uh, so now, you know, if it was able to jump from uh, the continental Europe to, um, to the UK, you could imagine that potentially could jump from the UK here to the US. Um, either, you know, coming uh, in a person, uh, migratory birds, you know, that type of thing. And uh, it actually can also be, uh, it has been linked to, um, uh, to raw milk uh, cheese, you know, uh, a number of different cases, you know, have been uh, in 2000 have been linked to, um, uh, so in this case it was not actually uh, tick-borne, it was actually uh, food-borne, um, that, that can happen, okay? So this is a contaminated, the virus contaminated a goat and it's milk and then the cheeses and then, you know, the consumers of that cheese, again, emphasizing that it was raw, okay? Ended up getting encephalitis, okay, meningitis. The one in the US that's similar to uh, tick-borne encephalitis virus is Poisson virus, and it's not very common. But it did, in fact, uh, uh, the North Carolina, the former uh, North Carolina Senator uh, Kay Hagan in 2000, we think that it was in 2016. And uh, she actually ended up develop, developing something that we call Poisson encephalitis. And sadly, you know, she uh, died in October of 2019. Uh, and in fact, in December of 2019, Congress passed the Kay Hagan Tick Act. Um, uh, providing money to provide assistance to combat, again, you know, not only Lyme disease, but other tick and vector-borne diseases and disorders. And Poisson virus is not uncommon. I mean, it's rare, but not uncommon here in New England. Uh, it is transmitted by the deer tick. So the, the Ixodes scapularis, the one, the one that we have, you know, a lot here. But what is different about Poisson is that transmission can occur within 15 minutes upon tick attachment. So you know that you have the rule of thumb, right? Um, it takes, you know, for Lyme, for the Lyme disease uh, bacterium to get transferred from the tick to the person, it takes, you know, 36, 48 hours for you to start the transmission. Um, so if you actually, you know, uh, you even have a tick, but at the end of the day, if you do a tick check, you know, if you shower and everything, do a tick, tick check and remove the tick, you're going to prevent transmission because you're doing it, you know, uh, within 24 hours or so. For, uh, for Poisson, there is no such a thing. So transmission occurs you know, within 15 minutes upon tick attachment. So, um, uh, so you know, if you remove, by the time that you probably find the tick and remove it, that type of thing, you may have already been um, uh, uh, infected with the virus. So we are doing the same thing. So this is unpublished data. We are doing the same thing here. These are, we are expressing the genes using those different types of mutations. This is a picture of a Poisson virus-like particle, beautiful, you know, icosahedral type of uh, virus particle. We are producing lots of it. We are, you know, this is part of the characterization. And we are, got, we are intending to, uh, to start um, this, those uh, immunization and challenges studies that I told you in a biosafety level three um, within the next month or so. So the, the, the work is ongoing for that. There is also, you know, uh, uh, an order called uh, uh, Bunia viralis, uh, Bunia viruses in general. The, the California serial group that I told you not only includes California encephalitis uh, viruses, but also uh, lacrosse encephalitis virus, Jamestown Canyon virus. These are viruses that are mosquito transmitted, and they are found here in the U.S. Reef Valley fever is actually mosquito transmitted, but it's not found in the U.S., but it has the potential to uh, uh, get here just like West Nile virus did. And there are a number of other tick-borne viruses that fall into this category. One of them is called tick, uh, uh, Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever virus. And these are fall into the hemorrhagic fever uh, bunya viruses. And just uh, last week, Turkey recorded 13 cases of this Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever, um, uh, uh, people that they actually die, okay? The fatality rate is about 10 to 40%. Um, we have here a, a sort of related virus called Heartland virus here in the US and uh, in Asia, China, you know, Japan, Korea, we have uh, a virus called severe fever with thrombocytopenia syndrome virus it has this long name. It has been renamed uh, recently. This one uh, uh, is transmitted by the Asian longhorn tick that we now have here in the US. So we are a little bit concerned about that. And we are already producing, you know, those virus-like particles for this new virus here, also with the intention to test it as a vaccine. So a lot of this work is ongoing. And I want to finish now. I know that I'm almost running out of time here. Uh, just by showing you this, this picture here. This is the, there's a, a committee called the International Committee on Taxonomy of Viruses. They typically meet, you know, one every year or so. 
and they produce um, a book that tends to be, it's a very, very thick book. I have the 2005 edition of this book, and this is a picture of it. And it lists all of the different viruses, you know, that have been described, that type of thing. And this is just uh, one page. It's, it's literally, you know, 800 pages or something. It's one page uh, with some of those slavery viruses. And if you look, you know, here, you'll see the Zika virus is listed right there, okay? The one that, I, that nobody was paying attention to. In reality, you know, we have 53 flavi viruses in the family of flaviviridae, but in the genus flavi virus, we have 53 different species that have been described there. So each name that you see here could be the next Zika, could be the next, you know, dengue, you know, that type of thing, right? So that's a little bit scary. And again, this is just for this genus here within this family, within this order. You know, if you click here, you you open this up, you know, and you'll see, you know, all of these different species and so on. This is actually done online now. They don't publish this book anymore because it just became too tricky. So the whole um, um, uh, the whole list of viruses now is available online. So let me finish now just by acknowledging some of the people that did actually the work with Zika. So uh, uh, Dr. Uh, O'Connell here and Dr. Jaspers, they uh, uh, um, did most of the work with Zika. Um, Yu Sheng Wang is a current graduate student in my lab. He's doing a lot of the work with the uh, tick-borne diseases that I told you, uh, Wasson virus, severe fever, and so on. Um, I need to acknowledge Dr. Uh, Doug Brackney at the Connecticut Ag Experiment Station. We are gonna be doing the challenge with Wasson virus in his facility and uh, 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 with his help. And I also have to, you know, uh, thank a number of other uh, people in places, but also, you know, the funding sources from NIH, USDA, and actually even from uh, internal funding here from uh, UConn. So uh, uh, I know I've, I'm sorry that we ran out of uh, a little bit. We went over my, uh, our time, but um, if you guys have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them. I'll stop sharing now so that, that I can see you guys because I can't see you in the presentation mode. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Berardi. All right, we do have a couple of questions. Um, we have a question from the audience. I know the test for Lyme disease tests for the immune response and not the actual virus. Uh, and the person is asking, can you speak to why that is? Why test for the response and not the virus? Um, you know, this person knows that the virus can stay in your body for years and can come back. Sure. So first of all, you know, it's not a virus. Lyme disease is called by a bacteria a bacterium called Borrelia burgdorferi. And the problem is this bacterium is present at levels that are so low, it somehow is hiding, it's persisting, like you said, for, long, for a long time, uh, long periods of time, but in very, very small numbers. So it really hides very well. So the tests that we do to actually detect the bacterium are not sensitive enough. And that's, that's you know, and that is a problem because the reality is that we go after the immune response but the immune response then becomes a little bit complicated because you know if it was a previous exposure, uh, you know, uh, um, you know that type of thing. Uh, because you know you do you do get treatment, and so uh, viruses cannot be treated with antibiotics, but bacteria can. So doxycycline is a treatment for Lyme disease, is a bacterium. So after the, the treatment, you don't know if you still have residual bacteria or not because you know you you will you will have an immune response. So and even the immune response test is not sensitive enough. I will be really honest with you. So what I can tell you is that this is an active area of investigation. NIH, in fact, is really funding a lot of research on um, new generation tests for Lyme disease because they absolutely realize that it is it's, it's very complicated. But uh, without going into details of the complexity of that, you know, uh, uh, will be hard. It's much more complex than a test for coronavirus or something like that. We got lucky with corona. We were able to design a, a test very easily, you know, uh, with no problems. Not the same for Lyme disease. Great, thank you. Okay, so there was another question that we shared in the chat. Um, do you project that the impacts of climate change will increase the ranges for tick and mo uh, mosquito populations? or just shift them? So maybe, you know, like we've heard about populations, say in the mid-Atlantic shifting up here to the Northeast. Um, do you think they're gonna shift or just overall increase? That's a very good question. And I think it's a, it's a, a little bit of both. I think it depends, it's gonna be very dependent on the particular place that you're talking about. So for us in the Northeast, in New England, we are probably gonna, gonna see more of those mosquitoes from the South, you know, uh, venturing up here, right? So for example, uh, there is a mosquito called Aedes aegypti. It is the one that mainly transmits dengue, 
uh, um, Zika and so on, and a number of other diseases. That mosquito, you know, was actually, uh, can sometimes be detected here, but they don't overwinter, they don't survive the winter. But in 2000, I believe it was in 2015, they were, they actually survived the winter in Washington, D.C., probably because they were protected, you know, in the sewage system, you know, the, the whole type of thing. Um, if we see those temperatures, you know, again, you know, increase, we, we expect the line to, to become, to go further north. And it wouldn't be, I wouldn't be surprised if we don't end up with the Aedes aegypti here. And in that case, you know, not only Aedes aegypti, but all of those diseases, you know, that Aedes aegypti can, can carry. Uh, in other places, like you said, you know, it could be the opposite. Maybe, you know, those places are going to get warmer, but, you know, are going to become drier. And that is not going to be very conducive to uh, mosquitoes and quite honestly, not even to ticks. So it was, it's going to really, really, really depend. But the bottom line is we're going to be changing um, the established, you know, equilibrium that exists into these ecosystems. And any time that you change that, viruses and pathogens will take opportunity, uh, right? Uh, absolutely. Okay, another question. Uh, so you mentioned that the smallpox vaccine particle was used um, for the Zika virus. Is that something that is common? Do um, diseases or you know other vaccines get modified and reused a lot to make new vaccines for new diseases? Yeah. So the, the, so that uh, the, that category of vaccine falls into the the the, the, the platform or category called uh, vector vaccine. So they they where they actually use one virus you disable that virus and you include the genetic information from another virus to try to use that as a vaccine. And uh, it has a number of different advantages, particularly in terms of production. They tend to be cheaper to produce and easier to produce. They tend to be more thermostable as well. So, you know, uh, we, we can't really ignore them as, uh, as one of the types of vaccines that we are producing. In fact, you know, we have now the Johnson & Johnson vaccine here in the US that falls into that same category uh, of vaccine. But uh, the Johnson & Johnson is an adenovirus base. I was working on a uh, vaccine virus base. The new work that we are doing now doesn't even involve a virus vector. It's just the virus-like particle itself that is um, just a protein that is um, uh, purified and given as an antigen. So it falls more into the category of subunit vaccines, that type of thing. So. Vaccines, you know, there are many types, you know, it's kind of complicated, but it's not unusual for us to test them that way. Okay. Um, a quick question. Uh, people are asking if you would make your slides available, um, if you'd be willing to share those. I I, uh, I believe I can share them. Uh, okay. um, yeah, I, if I you believe can get the presentation them to... will be shared, right? The, the yes. Whole... Yeah, the recording yeah. will be shared as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, if you want to get the slides to us, then we can make sure that they go out too. And I think we have time we can take one more quick question. Um, so speaking of vaccines, um, are mRNA vaccines likely to become widely available for other zoonotic diseases or just for SARS viruses? Or do you see another application for those? Yes, I do. I think a lot of it will depend on the, um, you know, how, uh, uh, will depend on the success of the COVID-19 right now. And it seems to be very successful, right? Uh, so I, 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 I absolutely, everybody in our field sees a huge, uh, opportunity for more messenger RNA vaccines to be made. They do have some advantages over, you know, the viral vector ones and so on, but they also do have uh, some disadvantages. So every type of, type of vaccine that you can think of will always have advantages and disadvantages. The disadvantage of the messenger RNA vaccines are that uh, we don't know much about the long-term immunity that they provide. We, they, they also are more expensive, no question. They do require, you know, more a technology that's not very standard in other poorer countries, that type of thing. So uh, their use, you know, sort of depends on on um, uh, countries like the US and Europe, you know, producing them. Remember, you know, when you're talking about infectious diseases, we have to think worldwide, right? Not just about us here. We cannot solve the problem here and leave all of those other countries, you know, uh, uh, without a vaccine or, or on their own because it's going to come back to bite us. So, uh, so you know, most likely there will be Room for messenger RNA vaccines are going to become even more more common, but I don't think that the other platforms that are more established and have their own advantages will disappear anytime soon. Right. Um, and I guess just to wrap up on a related note, what is your thought on when we might need a booster shot for the mRNA vaccines like Moderna or Pfizer? Sure. Yeah. So uh, for on, on that note, you know, obviously the companies and the CEOs are, are saying, oh, I think, you know, we need these shots you know, by the end of the year. 
Uh, well, you have to be a little bit skeptical of that because obviously they are selling as a product, right? So uh, the reality is I don't see any evidence that we'll need it by the end of the year. Uh, but I do see that we may, it may be smart for us, not for this fall, but for the fall of 2022 to get a booster shot. If nothing else changes, because, you know, things could change dramatically. The Delta, you know, uh, uh, variant, you know, it seems to be making its way here to the US, things can change. If, if, if things, you know, behave like the way that they are expected to behave right now, I would expect us to perhaps need a, a booster immunization or an updated vaccine that perhaps will contain some of these, you know, Delta strain variants and so on. Uh, by the fall of 2022, I think it would be smart to do that. But right now, I don't, really don't see anything that convinces me that by this fall or winter, we're gonna need one. But again, we have learned so much in the past two years, right? And, and yet know so little about this novel coronavirus right. that, um, that, you know, um, I, so yeah, I can't, th there's no way to predict anything here. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's something we've all learned. And thank you for touching on the Delta variant because that actually came in on the chat questions as well. So thank you very much, Dr. Verardi, for your presentation. Um, we appreciate you being here today.